the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today, we welcome back Danielle Olfrey. She's an internal medicine physician and editor-in-chief of the Bellevue Literary Review, and she's the author of the book, When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical Error. Today, we're going to talk about her most recent Kevin MD article titled, Getting an Appointment with Primary Care is the Achilles Heel of Medicine, and that's certainly something that I can relate to. I also do primary care internal medicine. Sometimes it does take eight to 10 months to get a physical appointment with me, so we'll certainly talk more about that. But Danielle, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kevin. So great to be back. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but for those who didn't get a chance to listen to our first episode together, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Sure. So I, I work at Bellevue Hospital, which is the oldest public hospital in the country. And I would probably qualify myself as a Bellevue lifer. So I did my medical training there, did my MD, PhD through NYU and, and Bellevue. And I did take off a year and a half after residency training to travel, did some locum tenens, started writing, but then came back to Bellevue because I just really love the, you know, urban medicine, the chaos, which the flip side is really freedom. And I love the patients and colleagues. So I've been there now for a couple of years and sort of on the side began doing more writing. And then we started the Bellevue Literary Review because we thought maybe a creative writing outlet, poetry, fiction, uh, essays about health and healing would be interesting. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. We're now an independent uh, nonprofit literary arts organization. So kind of balancing writing, editing, and of course, seeing my patients and uh, monkeypox. I was just in the ER twice last night mm. for some monkeypox cases. So if it's not COVID, it's monkeypox. Never a dull moment in primary care. <laughs> So as we all know, Bellevue is such an iconic medical institution in the United States. So you've been there for many, many years now. So just tell me what makes Bellevue so special as a primary care internal medicine physician? You know, it's special because its doors are open to all. There's no turning away anyone. And I, I once had an experience in locum tenens in a private practice where I had to turn a patient away because they weren't insured. And I hadn't realized that was the case. And I was told by the practice manager, oh, you can't just bring these patients here. And I would call that the lowest moment of my life, telling a patient, I cannot care for you because you can't pay for it. And I vowed then I'll never work in a place where I've turned someone away for basic primary care. So I do love the ethos. We take care of everyone, you know, from undocumented immigrants to presidents. We are the hospital in New York City for the president of the U.S. Should they need hospital care, urgent care when they're in New York? So we're ready for all, including pandemics, big and small. And it's just the vi vitality of a just incredibly diverse, but also incredibly challenging place. We have lots of students and residents who are all attracted by the mission, but really just want to do a great job. And so it's just a really special place to be. All right. And we're going to talk more about some of the challenges of primary care. And one of them is getting an appointment. And we're going to talk about that in your article titled Getting an Appointment with Primary Care is the Achilles Heel of Medicine. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it, share the story, why you decided to write it. Well, really from both sides of the equation. So nearly every patient says to me, doc, it's taken forever to get this appointment. It's like yeah. the, that, and I've waited so long in the waiting room. Those are the two comments. But really getting an appointment is so hard. And then I had to get an appointment for my you know, kid to get a pre-college physical. There was none to be had in the island of Manhattan. you know. And we have a lot of doctors in, in New York City. And to get a primary care for a new patient, months and months off, it was really a huge, like, detective project for me to get my kid an appointment and even then I couldn't get an in-person and I had to do a video visit first and I just I wanted a physical for a healthy kid yeah. and so it really you know woke me up to the issue of if we're trying to improve healthcare outcomes it really does start in primary care because lack of primary care as you well know most of us know leads to such downstream you know cost poor outcomes use of emergency care which is you know a terribly expensive inefficient and really not a good way to, to take care of chronic medicine, which is really most of what medicine is these days. And so, so much of what, you know, we want to accomplish in healthcare really, you know, lands up in primary care. And yet, you know, you can't get an appointment. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a new problem. I've been doing Kevin MD for almost 20 years now, and the shortage of primary care clinicians has been an ongoing theme. So in your view, what are some of the root causes why we cannot get appointments with primary care clinicians? There's a couple of things. I mean, one, one is reimbursement levels. I mean, there's no doubt that when you do primary care and spend the time educating your patient about exercise and diet, all the things that really work on, on, on treating chronic illnesses, 
that does not get a lot of reimbursement from insurance companies. So health systems, of course, want to focus on procedures, which make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, if you talk to a patient about eating broccoli or brown rice instead of white rice, which will have a real impact on their diabetes, maybe your institution will get 45 bucks. But if, while you're talking about kale and broccoli, you ran a CT scanner over them or, or put a tube into an orifice, like the reimbursement goes up so much. So of course, health systems really spend their energy and supplies and space and time on procedure-based you know, specialties, which I, I don't want to knock, they're important, but we really give short shift to primary care. And then of course there's salary differentials. So a lot of students with a, with a huge pile of debt from medical school, I mean, why not go into ophthalmology, make twice as much, hours are easier, less paperwork, less headache. So it's really hard to get people to go into primary care. So let's talk about the cost of education that may influence medical students' career choices. So I know one solution at NYU, for instance, medical school, I believe it's, 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 it's without cost now. So do you think that is a solution in terms of influencing more medical students to choose primary care as a career? Sure, but I, I felt that was a bit of a blunt instrument. I thought it could have been applied more selectively to offer free tuition for those interested in primary care, rural medicine, you know, inner city medicine, the, you know, geriatrics, things we really have a need. You don't need free medical tuition if you're going into plastic surgery. You know, you really don't. You can pay it back in six months. It's not an issue. But for people going into primary care or, you know, doing mission work overseas, that's really hard to do. Public health, epidemiology. So I think we or have some kind of sliding scale. Not that we want to force students to choose, but we could use those incentives, I, I think, differently. So that's one thing. I think the second thing that we can do is think a lot about what the primary care work life is like. And right now it's a bit of a dumping ground. Every other specialty can say, all oh, right, you know, talk to your primary care doctor. Every form, every, you know, every issue can be dumped on primary care. And we, of course, can never say no. And so, you know, so much of our time is taken up with all kinds of non-clinical work because our, our ambit is so wide. And we do more paperwork, I think, than most other, other fields. And, and so some attention to why are we doing this? And should all this be a primary care doctor's responsibility that we can, you know, funnel more non-clinical resources to let primary care doctors just do primary care? If I didn't have to spend so much time on, on answering messages and if I had more nurses, say, who could do some of that, I could see more patients. But right now, it's just really hard to do the clinical work when you're so laden down by other non-clinical issues. So I'm sure you saw this study as well in the last couple of weeks, like if primary care doctors were to implement every single recommendation, preventive care recommendation, it would take something like yeah. 27 hours a day or something like that. So right. just to go to your point. Right. And, and so some of that could be done, for example, vaccinations. That's really algorithmic. You know, the EMR could pull that up. You know, a nurse could do that. We don't need to have a primary care doctor figure out who needs a Shingrix vaccine. That, I mean, maybe you could sign off on it, but it could be done in a way that takes a lot of this primary care. We just instituted a new procedure at our hospital with fit testing for colon cancer screening. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just send a kit to every patient every year and not have you, you know, waste three more neurons on thinking about that at the expense of how do we control their hypertension? And lots of that could be done that way that doesn't, you know, just take up the primary care. Because you're right, it's really impossible to do. And of course, we reimburse so little for it so our, our institutions don't have money to hire a second, you know, clinical person or non-clinical person to take care of that aspect. Now you work with NYU medical students. So from their perspectives, what are their views of primary care? What kind of sense are you getting from the medical students that you interact with today? Well, I'll say this, when they do their rotations in AmCare, they love it. It's one of the best rotations because it's your first chance, honestly, to be a doctor. You know, because in primary care, we generally let students be the doctor and you suddenly get this window into the whole patient and not just this little narrow thing. And that's really gratifying. You really feel like a doctor. So students really love it. But they also see how stressed their attendings are and how much is going on, how much you've got to like do 50 things at once. And then you can see them and they'll say they are a little bit leery. Like it feels good, but do I really want to do that? So it takes a lot of inner drive to, to blast past the frustrating parts to, to, you know, key into the great parts of taking care of patients over years and seeing their families grow, but they are hesitant. They see how much, you know, how much baggage the primary care doctors hold. 
Now, as fewer and fewer medical students choose primary care as a career, that leaves an opening for nurse practitioners and physician assistants to fill that gap. So we're seeing more advanced practice providers go into primary care fields while physicians go into more specialty fields. And that's a trend that's been going on for the last few years and for the foreseeable future. What are your thoughts on that? I actually think it's a great resource because there's lots of primary care that's fairly straightforward and simple, and there's some that's really complex. And, you know, how do we define internist, right? What is an internal medicine doctor? And I think what we define ourselves on is complexity, that our patients with complex medical illnesses really do need an internist. They can't be taken care of by 10 specialists. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really the role for internal medicine physicians. And I welcome you know, the advanced practical, you know, care clinicians, there's so much of, of, you know, medicine that's really very easily done and widely done with, with less training. So I think you can work well together. We have a great model in our clinic where we work together with PAs and NPs, and I think it works very well, but then there are some cases that absolutely need an internal medicine doctor to really, you know, put together the complexities of, you know, liver failure and renal failure and, and diabetes and hypertension and psychiatric issues that many of our patients, but not all have. So where do you see that trend leading to? Because as more advanced practice providers go into primary care, medical institutions, they're probably not going to pay physician salaries for primary care. And that's going to further deter more medical students from going to primary care. So what do you think about that potential scenario? I think it it will come down to the research to showing outcomes because we are interested in outcomes and there is money on the table for outcomes. And so for, for complex cases, the outcomes are very difficult, I, I think, to manage you know, without advanced level training. And if we're looking for, for example, diabetes control, you know, for simple patients, it's easy to get their glucose, you know, their A1C under eight. For complicated patients, it's very hard. And so institutions that are trying to do that will probably see, I think, poor outcomes if they you know, get rid of all their primary care doctors. So I, I, I think we can have a balance. And I really do enjoy the team approach where one patient can have several practitioners as part of their team. And maybe they'll see the PA, their MP for some of their visits, and they'll see me for some of their visits. And that often works very well. And so I, I think we can make the case that it's cost effective and we can have good outcomes if we have, you know, take advantage of the strengths of all the different team players, nutritionists, pharmacists. I mean, having a pharmacist on our team now, my patients can see me you know, fewer times that probably saves money, but they can get the good care they need if we can all work together. So I think we can make that case. We'll just need our, our, you know, primary care health researchers to point that out. We're talking to Danielle Ofri. She's an internal medicine physician, and she's the author of the book, When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical Error. We're talking about her latest Kevin MD article titled, Getting an Appointment with Primary Care is the Achilles Heel of Medicine. So Danielle, what's the path forward? So I think that a lot of things that you brought up, like the pay disparity between proceduralists and primary care, that's been going on for decades now. So anything more immediate in terms of what we can do to fill that primary care access gap? Well, again, you know, cutting some of the the non-clinical work we have to do and getting more support. But I think, you know, when we want to make the case to our institution about why we need more time with primary care clinicians, I usually try to frame it around two things. One is patient safety and one is patient satisfaction. Again, these are two metrics that people in suits care a lot about because again, money's on the table for those Mm -hmm. things. And if you ask a patient, you know, what makes them feel good about where they go? You know, very few are gonna mention, oh, the nice coffee machine, the graham crackers, the valet parking. What they really enjoy is time with their doctor, you know, enough nurses on the clinic or on the wards. Those things really impact how patients feel. And so often we, we, we go for window dressing when it comes to improving patient satisfaction scores, but ask any patient if they'd rather have fancy coffee or a longer visit with their doctor, you know what they'll choose. And so we can make that case. And the second one is patient safety, which we care about a lot. You know, we are trying to decrease medical errors to decrease patient harm on all fronts and having primary care doctors spend more time with their patients. It, there's no doubt that I think it improves patient safety because the flip side, we spend fewer minutes with our patients and cut corners. And I can see to my own patients. I know they're not getting as good care. I'm sure I'm making mistakes. And so if I can have longer time with my patients, I can be really careful about medication reconciliation, you know, checking their labs, all of those things. And, and so making that case in terms of patient satisfaction and patient safety to the point of why we need more time with primary care and more access to primary care, I think is the 
quickest and the short term way to, to at least get the attention of those in decision making roles. So you have a platform here where we have a lot of medical students and medical trainees listening to you. Why should they consider primary care as a career? And maybe you could end off with some take home messages. It's the best field out there. I have to say when, when a patient thinks about who is their doctor, they're typically not mentioning their surgeon, their podiatrist, their ophthalmologist, even though they may like them, love them. But who is their doctor when they need counsel, advice, when they're worried, when they feel sick? That's their primary care doctor. And having that connection is so special because when you think about how do you move the needle for a patient to make them come out of their experience feeling better, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of that, it really falls in the lap of primary care. We, you know, we of course need and love our specialists to help for things that we can't do. But the gratification, the gratitude of being in the primary care spot, there's nothing like it. I, mean, I have a patient that I started taking care of when I was an intern, and I will not tell you how long ago that was, but he was discharged, you know, post MI, NEMD, and I picked up his chart. We've been together now. We've outlasted our friends' marriages, you know, remakes of the healthcare system, our clinic, we've done all that stuff, you know, presidential administrations. We're still together. I've seen him raise his children, his grandchildren. You know, it's so gratifying. And now we're approaching this, you know, later stage in his life and th thinking about advanced care planning and that I can be with him to think about, you know, the end of life care as well is really special because he really trusts me. I know him so well. He can walk in. I know instantly when something is wrong, even on the phone. I, I don't need any blood tests. I can tell. And having that kind of relationship, there's really nothing like it. Danielle, thank you so much for coming back on the show, sharing your time and insight. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.